Sure. Yes. Something like that. Um, what do I need to do? Okay. Behold my screen. Alrighty. Um, okay, so basically it turns out that the best way to talk about debuggers is to first talk about what the debug E is actually doing. So we're going to do a lightning tour of the debug E and then I'm going to give you a short demo. Um, this is a pristine on trammel JavaScript environment. It's got a global object, which is an object with a bunch of properties named date, and math, and such like that. Um, and it's got a global environment. An environment is something which takes, in this case, takes an object's properties and reflects them as variables. The global object has properties, the global environment has variables. Um, so we're going to, um, hello. Okay, so we're going to actually uh, look at what happens when we uh, load this function and call it. This is just a function where you give it a message and a delay, it registers a timeout. When the delay is expired, the function is called and we display a message. Okay, so the first thing that happens is you compile the function. That gets broken up into two scripts, one script for the outer function and one script for the inner function. Okay, so there's two scripts involved here. Okay, then we actually go and make a function object. The function, if you remember from school, is a pair. It's got a pointer to code and it's got a pointer to an environment, right? So there we are, and its code is the outer function. Okay, now we're going to evaluate this expression. Call alert later, and I have it say, say please say blurb uh, one second later. Those are milliseconds, okay? Um, and the or use the stack frame. So now we're going to have a seven second stack frame for the function call. It has an environment where the arguments are bound to their values. Okay, um, the first thing that, that, and then we're running the outer script there. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to create a function object, right? The function object has the code, which is the inner script, and the environment captures the, uh, the, 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 the closure that the function's environment is the current environment, right? So we've captured the environment that's got bindings for message and delay, okay? Then we actually go and tell the event loop about that. I always feel like the event loop looks like a bu buzz saw, I mean, you may feel differently. Um, so then we return from, the, we return from the, the call, and notice that the environment persists. The stack frames are gone. That control flow no longer needs to be represented, but the environment still exists, and the, the function is pointing to it. Now, at some point, the event loop fires, the, event, the, the, the timeout fires, the event loop forgets about it because it's done its job. Um, so we've got this call to the anonymous function. It's got its own environment, which is an extension of the closure's environment. But since we still have the bindings for message, we actually have the value that we need to pass to alert and it displays. So one thing I'd like to point out is that what we have here is a complete picture of the semantics of a JavaScript program. We've got everything you need to know. You could, just, you could define the semantics of JavaScript in terms of changes to pictures like this, right? But oddly, only these things are actual JavaScript values, right? There's no JavaScript value which corresponds to a stack frame or an environment or a script. All you've got is objects in JavaScript. So what we need in the debugger, we need to be able to talk about all these things, right? Okay, so what all the debugger is, and this is the complete debugger API, it is a set of shadow classes for all these kinds of things. There's a debugger.object, which is a reflection-oriented interface talking about the object. There's a debugger.environment, where you can look at variables and find what the parent environment is. There's a debugger.frame, which is like, okay, who's my caller? What are my arguments? And there's a debugger.script, which is like, give me the bytecode offset for this source position, right? And what's your URL and things like that. Okay, um, and then there's the debugger itself. A debugger identifies its debuggees as a set of global objects, right? You say, I'm going to debug this one, this one, and this one. Anything else that happens in the scope of a global object that's not one of your debuggees, you don't deal with, right? So it's actually um, capability, uh, what is it, what do they call that? Capability uh, security model safe. If you can't get to the global, you can't debug it, right? Um, so eventually, maybe we could uh, expose this to, uh, to content. Um, although that's, that's sort of in the works. Now the cool thing is that actually all those shadow objects live in a separate compartment, or can live in a separate compartment. So you can have the debugger sitting running in Chrome, and, with, and the, the debugger JavaScript code talking to all these objects directly, but then the debuggy is actually sitting over in an unprivileged uh, content compartment. Um, here is the AV doc, right? I mean, just glance over it, everything's sort of what you expect. The only interesting thing, take, take a look at uh, debugger.frame. Um, if you've got a frame instance, you can set non-step handler on it. Debugger, you know, say frame dot on step equals function. And every time the thing does a single step, your function gets called. Um, and, and there's an on top handler, there's an on enter frame handler, there's an on, on throw, on exception thing. Um, environments can be query. Basically, it's got everything that you need to plot or draw or display the, the debugging state however you want. Okay, so now, how am I going time wise? 
Okay, um, so this is a patch. Uh, J Jason Orndorff wrote a quick little uh, command line JavaScript debugger called JoranDB just to exercise things, right? It's about maybe less than a thousand lines of code, but it's a complete debugger because it's built on our stuff. Um, so I'm taking uh, Jason's debugger. You can see up the front the, the gray code is what's already there. It creates a debugger object, it creates a debuggy global object, a new global code of the shell thing. And then it says debugger not add debuggy, the debuggy global. Okay, now we've got it. A debuggy, and we can load, evaluate stuff in, the, in that in that scope, and the debugger will see it. Okay, that's all existing code. The black code is what I added to it. Okay, the first thing I do is say bar. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a debugger that will plot all the call function calls and returns that you make. Right. So we create a call plotter, new debugger, and so we've got two debuggers watching the same debuggy. That works fine. Okay, and we create a call log which starts out as an empty array. Um, function describe completion is just string formatting stuff. It makes something, it prints some, something nice, but ignore it. So then we take our debugger, call plotter.onenter frame, that is every time the debuggy enters a frame, call this function, it gets past the frame. So we push an entry describing what we just called on the call log, right? And then we say, okay, frame, when you get popped, please call this function and tell me how you, how you return. Did you throw, did you return a value, were you terminated like out of memory or slow script or what have you, right? And all the handle pop function does is it says call log dot push and it pushes an entry, right? And at the very end, when Jordan would be exits, we write our log as JSON to a file called call log dot js. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to switch back to video and I want to share my terminal with you. Um, okay, cool, that actually worked. Nice to have low standards. <laughs> Catfib.js. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the actual function I'm going to run. We've got a traditional recursive, gratuitously recursive factorial function, and then we have a very gratuitously recursive Fibonacci function, and I want to show you just how gratuitous that recursion is. Um, okay, I'm going to start Joran DB here. Again, it's like the, 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 the JavaScript shell has really mm -hmm. lousy formatting capabilities, so it's actually going to be difficult. Okay, I'm going to say print, um, so I'm going to load, load this file in. Uh, the load fib.js is the JavaScript code that's actually running in the debuggy, and then I'm going to say print the factorial of 8, which is, I trust that, and I'm going to print the 8th Fibonacci number, right? Okay, and then I'm going to say, okay, done. We wrote that all to a JavaScript file, uh, and it, this is the data that that thing wrote, right? Remember, we had this little debugger that we, we had a second debugger that we created that watched frame enters and exits, and it created this record of, of push and pops. Okay, and then, uh, okay, I'm going to switch again with your desktop, and I want to share with you, um, is it nightly, or is it, yeah, how are we doing here, okay, yeah, that looks right, um, okay, and so now what I've got, I've got an HTML file which slurps up um, the call log .js. that's the thing that we just made our little debugger right, and plots it as an HTML, plots it with, H, with a nice canvas thing, right? So we can see the first thing we did was we actually did the load. That little red stuff over there is the load that we did, right? And then we called the factorial of eight, right? You can see the factorial just grows a stack and then returns it and you can see the values uh, getting accumulated in the end. And then you can see just how bad that Fibonacci definition is because it really takes a long time to compute something which, which really um, isn't that involved, okay? So, Again, what I want to emphasize here is that um, the amount of code required to uh, do a, a, a simple analyzer is very small. I create a new debugger in one line, right? I can set up something to watch stack frames in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. Right. This, this is, is something, something where if you don't actually want to use the debugger, debugger really, why, once we get this in the scratch pad, and we, we, we will get the debugger available in the scratch pad, um, you can just whip up your own debuggers just for the problem that you know you're trying to solve. Right? So, and that's undone.